what feeling did you get when you bought your home down south? It's indescribable, is what I'll say. I will articulate the feeling. Um, there is no greater feeling that when you open that door, that no landlord can increase your rent or give you a notice to move out. Let me just, that is worth so much. And when I, and when I opened the door, I was like, why didn't anyone tell me this earlier? Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Freedom Fighters. How good is your life? Are you loving it or hating it? Do you give thanks for each and every day? Or are you constantly frustrated and disappointed with life and where it's actually heading? And how do you feel when you hear someone say that we're just living in the lucky country? Now, I'm sure there'll be times when you think and feel each extreme at these questions, which is actually pretty normal. But there's one thing that I can assure you after traveling extensively and living and working in many countries across the globe over the years, is that Australia is by far the best place to live in the world and an absolute land of opportunity. And the emphasis here is on opportunity, because an opportunity is just that. It's up to you what you do with it. Now, opportunity gives you the runway. But as I said, it's up to you to decide whether you show the persistence and determination to exercise and build the daily muscles needed to create the wings required to fly, or you can choose to laze in the sun on the tarmac, tarmac and complain that the plane's late, that the waiting lounge chairs aren't comfortable enough, you're sick of waiting and the host, host, hostess surface just isn't good enough, because there's always something else or someone else that's stopping you from living the good life. Why do I say this? Because I'm concerned as a growing victim mentality and finger-pointing culture in Australia is perpetually dissatisfied because nothing's ever good enough. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that we've actually got it too good in this country and we just don't realise how good life is and how it can be here. Like frogs in a slowly boiling pot, we forget to realise that we're actually drowning in a pool of relative ease and luxury where continuous lifestyle inflation and ever escalating insta expectations mean that nothing's ever good enough. We're always wanting and expecting more. As our lives and experiences improve, our advances just become the status quo, the commonplace and the minimum expectation as we continuously compare ourselves to others, an approach that's going to leave us eternally unhappy and striving for the next best thing and always leaving us wanting, frustrated, and disappointed. Because when expectation exceeds experience, you're always going to be dissatisfied. So let me ask you a question that I ask pretty much everyone that I've got the privilege to help and work with. How much is enough? How much is enough for you to live your ideal life? Not anyone or everyone else's life, but your ideal life. Not what you should do or what others are doing or have, but what do you need? What will help you feel fulfilled and content? Because if you take the time to get clear on what your ideal day, week, month and year looks like in alignment with your core values, in terms of what you're doing with who, where and when and what legacy you want to live, then all you need to do is to invest your time, energy and money in a way that's going to turn your dream life into reality over the long haul. And from first-hand experience, I can tell you that this clarity around your life vision creates a motivi motivating magnet and guiding purpose to keep you focused and taking the actions required to make it happen. And this crystal clear vision also gives you a compass because every decision that you then make day to day is made on whether it's taking you closer to or further away from your ideal lifestyle. You're then less affected and distracted by what you should do or what others are doing and you become more focused on what's really important to you and how you want to live. And this creates an underlying sense of personal contentment that's free from outside influences. You become content with the direction you're taking and you're less concerned with where you're at and more focused on where you're heading. So how do you want to live and how much is enough for you? 
If you can't answer this, then I implore you to take some time out to reflect on this and get really clear on it. I'm sort of betting that you won't, but I challenge you to actually make the effort because it's actually been the best thing that my partner in all things, Sonia and I, have ever done and we continue to do. So prove me wrong because anyone who knows me appreciates that I'm never concerned about where you're at as now is just a point in time and space. But I'm very interested in where you're heading and what you're doing about it as true contentment comes from knowing where you're heading, committing to it, and then enjoying the journey. Now, I've often heard that contentment is the thief of achievement, but I beg to differ. Contentment doesn't mean being totally comfortable and giving up. It means that you're coming from a place of gratitude and abundance and are driven to help others, because for me, true fulfillment comes from giving freely and helping others without ever expecting anything in return. And the resulting inner peace and contentment in turn becomes a powerful positive magnet to energetically attract the right situations and circumstances in your life when combined with constant and consistent choices and proactive action. Just try it. I mean, what have you got to lose? You see, I've come to realise over the years that you don't become a happy and fulfilled person when you attain your version of success. It's actually the other way around. You need to feel happy and content deep down in your heart and bones first and then success on your terms will energetically happen when strengthened by committed action. Now, this doesn't mean it's easy. You still have to do the hard work and commit the daily disciplines and happy habits that are going to build your patience, persistence and resilience muscles to make it happen and overcome the inevitable speed bumps so that you last the long-term distance to allow the magic of compounding returns and exponential growth to do its work. And it's this endurance that generally separates those who make it happen from those that expect it to happen, because sustainable success is a constant journey, not an overnight destination. And someone who's recognised how good we've got it here in Australia and has made the most of each and every opportunity and demonstrated all the constant hard work and resilience to transform the possibility into reality is today's guest, Aaron Christie David. As you're about to hear, Aaron moved here to Australia when he was young and has actually seized the opportunity that many Aussies take for granted and has continuously done what it takes and taken the action to make it happen instead of letting it happen, driven by his underlying, unrelenting attitude of gratitude. As a fellow mortgage broker, Aaron's come from humble beginnings to build his award-winning Atelier Wealth business together with his, with his wife and family, and he's just released his new book, The Happy Home Loan Handbook, which we're going to deep dive on after unpacking his inspirational life journey to date. So, welcome and let's get invested, Aaron. Hey, Bushy, how you doing? Really good, mate. Uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to join you on uh, uh, your podcast some time ago. So we're well overdue to return the serve and, and a great opportunity with the, your new book coming out. But uh, Aaron, for, for those who haven't come across you yet, can you sort of start off by uh, talking to us about what you do differently and probably more importantly, why you do what you do? Yeah, look, I, I'm going to first of all say thank you very much for the leading words that you had there. And I feel like what you've said there very much lays the foundation for what I truly believe in and what we do here in our business. Um, yeah, you know, like you said, I grew up, I'd say humble beginnings. Uh, my parents are from Sri Lanka, so they moved here when, you know, there's a civil war going on in Sri Lanka. So my brother was four, I was two. Um, my younger brother was born here. And we would never have had these opportunities afforded to us in this country that we would have had in our me and our motherland and my, mom was, my parents have always been big on telling us that um this country you know education system healthcare system uh medical system whatever you want this country will give it to you in droves you've just got to show up and you'll take the opportunities with both hands and i, I feel like my and my mum watched a lot of oprah growing up and i feel like you know that that influence on mum uh also let us yeah you've got to get educated so yeah, I guess the way to, to break the migrant cycle is to get as educated as possible. So yeah, all of my brothers and I all went to uni, went on to do postgrad as well. It was like, just get a job in an office, just wear a suit and go. <laughs> and that was my mum's definition of making it. Uh, so naturally, finance was a very good fit to wear a suit. <laughs> and uh, But I think one thing that stayed with me was the great Australian dream, like the, the notion of having your own place, being able to buy your own home, be able to buy a piece of Australia. My parents were always like, buy, buy as quickly as you could. When you started working, you know, I probably dismissed it because it came from my parents. You know, you don't listen to your parents, but you see someone else do it. 
and like I should be doing what they're doing. And uh, yeah, ultimately, this notion of uh, home ownership has taken me had taken me through to, to mortgage broker. And it happened to fall into finance as well. Uh, so it was a pretty good, I guess, uh, marriage of my skill set and what I wanted to achieve in life as well. Yeah, yeah well, I love it, mate. Uh, the we'll sort of unpack a little bit of how you got into mortgage broking in, in a second, but uh, I'd love for you to share more of why you do what you do at Atelier Wealth. Yeah, look, uh, very similar to mortgage brokers. We're same, same, but different. And so, yeah, like I said, mortgage broker is such a level playing field that every single broker you go to has the exact same Commonwealth bank loan, the exact same St. George or Macquarie bank loan. It's the philosophy or how they do it that makes the difference. And one of the big um, philosophies in our business is it's not about the loan, it's about the home. The loan is simply the vehicle to buy the property. The loan is simply the vehicle to buy the investment or the home. And what we're really trying to do is go, how do you make a good decision here? So it's not about the interest rate. Yes, rates are important. But when you're looking to buy, you're going, okay, where am I going to live? What does this mean for my family? How long am I being this property for? Uh, if it's an investment, okay, what's the reason that you're buying the property? Are you going to sell it? Are you going to renovate it? Are you going to uh, cash in when the market goes up, for example? Is it a long-term buy and hold for your family you know, to build into generational wealth? And again, that's something that we're very big on. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get a massive inheritance, nor is my wife, Bernadette. So... Uh, there is no, there's no time to save us in that sense. So we're going, mate, we're on the journey. And I think that's where a lot of businesses typically start is either solving a pain point you go, I need to do this for myself. I need to build my own wealth, first and foremost, to put the gas mask on myself and then burn it in. And then now I've got two girls. I need to then put the gas mask on them at some point in the future. And it's, I feel like the next generation is the haves and have nots in property. And it will be an uneven playing field for the kids that have parents that are property backed versus not yeah. and i just want to be in the good camp which is i want to have property yeah i love that and we'll, we'll deep dive into that uh, in uh part two when we will we talk about the book but uh yeah. for those who sort of want to understand a bit more about your journey so far uh, can you sort of wind back and talk us through where you personally invested your time energy and money over the years and why and how has this then led you to what you're now doing yeah so look if you go back was a decent school uh went on to get university qualified as well and i think that was you know where i probably you know a good circle of friends you know everyone's sort of been studying i studied my undergrad was in marketing and then from that point i wanted to get a corporate role uh which is a really good foundation and i guess in corporate there's the trappings of corporate life which is you know, an element of keeping up for example and uh, and i got my first break into finance when i started working at wizard home loans just before the gfc so very early on, challenger brand has suited me because I'm a challenger by nature. I like being second. Um, I like being the underdog, and so it really much aligned to my to my values. Let's take on the let's take on the the big wigs and uh, and try and take them down. So I, I love that um, that environment. It attracted a certain type of individual that believed in the vision that Mark Burris had at the time uh, until that got acquired at the height of the GFC. Um, at that point, I took a redundancy. Uh, I bought into a gym, and I thought, "How good is this? I'm a twenty-something-year-old, and I'm going to get paid to train." And did that for a bit until my parents were like, "You'll stop wearing shorts to work and go back, get a real job, and get a property." Uh, so that took me back into into corporate, and I got a job back at Commonwealth Bank, and yeah, working in the marketing team there as well. So um, one thing led to the next, led to the next, and then working with mortgage brokers at Commonwealth Bank gave me a pretty good um, feel for okay. Brokers are making a difference in people's life. They make an impact. Maybe, just maybe, I'll scratch this itch. And it wasn't until Bernard and I went away on our honeymoon. And it's just sliding doors bushy. Like we're sitting, we're sitting there and we had dreams and aspirations. We're going to live in New York. I was going to study my MBA. Uh, that was the trajectory that, you know, people followed in, in, in the bank. And then I'd travel the country as some type of executive manager or, or general manager. And it wasn't until that point where we said, hang on, and you talk about designing your life, we said that that's going to take me further away from the goal of actually being around a family. I mean, traveling and everyone that I knew that was at that level in the bank was either divorced or significantly overweight. And I just thought, hang on, is this really what we want? Um, and I'm going to have a massive student debt as well. Why don't I take that money and put that into effectively a, a real life MBA, which is your own, own business? And 
Bernie said, and I think your Sonia is a bit like my Bernie. Uh, they'll call us out on things. So I came back from that trip and she's like, you haven't done anything. It's been two weeks. So I'm like, right, I'm going to show you. And I went and bought a mortgage choice franchise <laughs> the next week. And I'm like, right. And she's like, there's no business plan. What are we doing? And I said, I don't know. Mate. We're just going to figure this out. We're going to figure this out. And I think when you, I, I work, like I said, I'm a challenger. So when my back's against the wall, that's when I do my best work. And uh, I just thought, right. I've gone from a really good six-figure income to zero. I've got to find a way to make this work. And since then, it's just been a series of it's, And that's what it is, taking, making decisions like an opportunity. So I was lucky because the market was obviously growing in a Sydney market. So I've got in a good time. And then opportunity is what you make of it. So I kind of grabbed it with both hands. And, and look, the mortgage choice model was good for me at a certain point until I kind of grew the model, wanted to do our own thing, which is where we then started our own brand. Yep. Uh, but like I said, this got me to that level and I'm, I'm super, super grateful. Yep. And that's when we started Atelier Wealth, which is, you know, mid this year will be eight years in operation. Yeah, and right. uh, I look back and again, you talk about designing your life. And, and I think at your very start of the intro, you talked about uh, we might get a little bit lazy because of our lifestyle. Hundred percent. I worked hard for nothing at the very start. There was no money coming in at the start, but I worked like a demon because I knew I could see a future. And now, eight years in, yeah, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a decent income, or if I'm, my family don't go without. Um, and I can feel sometimes the salary does make you lazy. Uh, and I say that to our team. I'm like, you take the salaries away. We will work very, very hard because it's what we do. We're not working for the income. We're working for the people. And lose perspective, lose perspective of that sometimes as well. A absolutely right. It, it's a necessity is the mother of invention, as, as they always say, and there's no greater motivator than one in, having to put uh, bread and butter on the table for the family. I mean, the, the, there's some really good varied experiences there from from Wizard under Boris and uh, uh, through to the bank. Uh, yeah. The big corporate uh, structure where just about every minute's managed down to the minuscule and then then into the uh, mortgage choice fraternity before uh, doing your own thing. If we sort of drew a line through all those uh, and we looked at the good and uh, bad and ugly of the experiences you had, uh, what were they and how has that sort of uh, informed what, what you now do with Atelier Wealth? There's no, and I, I, at the time there might be bad things where you go, look, I'm going to leave mortgage choice, I'll build this up and I'm going to go back to zero again. Um, that's just one example. But there was never a bad time where I'm like, this is a wrong decision. Uh, I feel like I've already, I, I backed myself to go, I'll make a decision, I'm going I'm going ahead. And maybe it's a bit strong-willed uh, in one sense, but maybe it's just going, I'm just going to back myself. And uh, I think for me, that conviction he then translates into what we're doing. I have real conviction in what we're doing. I truly believe in what we're doing. That then comes out in my conversations to people. It's a level of confidence that I'm like, let's make some decisions. And someone's got to lead. Someone has to lead. A client or their broker. Someone's in control. Someone's got to lead. So when the client says, call me back in six months, and maybe we'll have a chat. I'll call them back in six months. Going, Are we going to keep doing this dance where I just keep calling you back in six months' time? And there's no accountability or do you want someone that's going to keep you highly accountable and help you make decisions? Like, what are we doing? Here? And I say that very politely, but that's ultimately what we're doing. Like, love it. Love it. yeah, put the call cycle. That's not going to achieve any dreams. Yep. Uh, it's beautifully said, Mal. Like, yeah, if we sort of look back then on uh, your journey so far, both personally and professionally, what uh, challenging you've been uh, in your life uh, has brought about your greatest learnings and best changes, do you think? If the penny dropped for me, I think it was getting married. At that point, I feel like, and some people have that when they have children, for example. Some people maybe have that, that, that moment early in their life. But for me, I probably felt that moment when we got married and I was like, I, and it's not to be a chauvinist, like the man has to be ahead of the house, but I was like, I want to be the leader yeah. in this relationship. And I think Bernie has very strong feminine energy. And I'm masculine, so it kind of worked. And she's looking to me to a lead. And I'm like, right, you're now the CEO of your household. How am I going to run this? How am I going to run this this business? And I'm like, I want us to have a good life. It's not an easy one that it's going to take years before this comes to fruition. Like any business takes time to become profitable. 
But if we want to invest in ourselves and we've done a lot of personal development investment, like we've done Tony Robbins, we've done courses, we invest in coaches, uh, that's one thing that I've been very, very big on. Uh, and then the other part is there's no shortcuts to success. And Bernadette will always talk about the Saturday mornings that we sat in the office punching out applications and, then, you know, everyone's at the cafe downstairs because we work in a really funky part in Sydney. And I said to Bernie, just one day, don't worry, one day we'll have the cafe breakfast on a Saturday. It's cool. Um, until then, we're in the office on a Saturday morning doing, doing loan applications. And I'm like, it will pay off, I promise. And again, you got to make good on those promises. And I think that kind of kept me to account going, you've promised something, now deliver. And yeah, I like to think that I have. The job is certainly not done. But we are on the journey. Love it, love it, mate. Uh, let's switch and, and have a bit of a chat about money because, it, let's face it, uh, in the, the current modern world, it's the oil that lubricates every transaction. Yeah. And what does money mean to you, Eric? Look, I'm going to say state of wallet equals state of mind. And uh, I'm the big believer. You, you come across people, in, and especially in the line of work that we do, our, day, our, our business is money. And it's debt. And I think you see a lot of people's um, insecurities around it, or you see people that are really bullish with it as well in terms of debt. Uh, I like to think it's a happy medium. So to me, money can control you. It can definitely control you. It can get the better of you. Uh, I've been a victim of that personally where I'm like, it can buy you things that you think are going to impress people uh, or you think you're, you're better than everyone else. But then it's a bit like time where you have so much in the day, it's how you use it, and some people are better at it. And I guess I'm very fortunate that I get to see the people that have done exceptionally well, and I get to see the people that have done not so well, and I get to see people that have the opportunity and potential that just haven't used it as well. Isn't the good, the bad, the ugly, the great? Um, I mean, yeah, we're so privileged, Bushy, that, yeah, as brokers... Yeah, we get to see everyone's intimate details. I think financial planning is probably the only other part, maybe an accountant that gets to see it, the level of detail. And it's a huge amount of trust. Like people put a huge amount of trust in giving us that 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 sensitive information, personal, personal, confidential information. And I don't have any judgment around what what everyone's done. Because I think like what you said, it's not about what you are at the moment, it's where you're looking to go. Even what you mentioned at the start. And so I'm always looking what, what, what's the plan? And if there's no plan, that's when I get worried. All right, right. We're just you probably see quite like, a bit of that, really, I would imagine. Sorry, mate? You probably see quite a bit of that where there is no plan. Yeah, I think it's either then they're unsure, they're unconfident, you know, they're not confident about their own future, or they're just lacking the guidance and the leadership. Okay, cool. We can work with the guidance and leadership. We can find a really good team around you. Like, perfect, let's do that. But when you're unsure about your own future, when you're unsure about your own money, someone else is going to be better at taking that money off you. That becomes a worry. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, beautifully said, mate. How much do you see fear uh, driving uh, decisions or, or lack of decisions in money in your experience in the game? I'd say fear drives more decisions than confidence and, uh, and future prosperity. I mean, if that was the case, everyone would be buying an investment property because we know at some point that's going to be an, a, yeah, a nest egg for retirement. So it's an, if you ask people, should you invest in your future, that's effectively what super is. It's a no-brainer. Clearly, it's even mandated that we have super to invest in our future. Now, is buying an investment property a, 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 an insurance policy for the future that you've got something to fall back on? Absolutely. So why are we all doing it? Then it's fear. Okay, the tenants are going to trash the property. The property price is going to fall. The rates are going to go up negligence it's going to cost me an arm and a leg in maintenance and so you can kind of see i, I do this a lot with 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 clients I even done with my own team which is uh tim ferris's fear setting exercise which is an yes. awesome awesome yeah and i often say that buying a property holds up a mirror to your greatest fears doesn't it you see that and so when you're talking to someone and it just boom, just spills out and it's like okay cool let this out you know there's insurance for that you know there's protection against that you know there's a fixed rate for that there's and you can um, rationally address these, but fear is irrational. Fear is highly emotional, and 
I get to see the people that have gone, okay, I can see that. Let's let's take some action. All these people just get stuck in that fear side and so they just can't break through. And look, sometimes I don't think it's their fault. Sometimes it's the environment that they've grown up in, which is money was money was scarce growing up. The money conversations weren't open. Uh, money doesn't grow on trees was what was got said. Rent is dead money. Um, someone that's rich has fleeced someone else to become rich. Like there's all these different um, paradigms that you could grow up with. And certainly for me, growing up, we don't speak about money like culturally. It's like you don't talk about it. Everyone on the outside has um, you know, wonderful cars and, and, and a beautiful one. But no one ever spoke about debt levels, like heaven forbid, you know, don't tell everyone what's down behind, yeah, under the hood. Uh, but on the outside, it's all, you know, it's all hunky-dory. And um, and when you see that uh, quite often, the number one killer for relationships is financial mismanagement. Yep. So again, we're just going, hang on, money is a central part of relationships, well-being. I call it wealth-being. Um, you, you talk about that and it's like, well, hang on, well, why aren't we having more good conversations about money and your podcast, what we do, or the books that are published, all these people are just trying to go, how do we raise the financial literacy bar in this country? That's all we're trying to do. Yeah, 100%. Now, and Aaron, I'd love to transition and pivot now uh, into your property journey, if we can. Yeah. At, the, at the end of the day, you're borrowing money and, and money yet in your world and my world is is revolving around the whole properties for you. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to us through, and, and clearly uh, what you've already shared with us, you've shown a lot of courage and confidence to make the changes that you uh, had. And you know, a lot of people wouldn't jump off the cliff and start their own business uh, given the, the financial fears that we just sort of touched on. But uh, can you sort of give us a bit of a run through, you know, why did you decide to invest in property? What triggered your interest? And what fears did you have and how did you overcome them when you got started? Yeah, my parents were always like, buy property, buy property. And again, didn't take action until I, you know, probably a few years down the track. And I think being a, being a wizard, I saw a few other colleagues start to do it. I'm like, okay, how did you do it, for example? And uh, that got me guys. So I bought my first property. I would have been, I'm going to say about 25 for my first, first investment property. It was a small unit. Uh, two bedroom unit in a suburb called North Parramatta. Uh, you know, Parramatta was dubbed to be the second CBD. Uh, nearly twenty years later, I'm still waiting for that to happen. <laughs> and look, I had no idea. My the real estate agent played cricket with my dad. That's how it got started. And he said, "Look, here's your first property. Uh, it's like three. I, I, I'm going to say it's somewhere like three hundred and twenty thousand. Um, had no idea what I was doing. Walked through. I was like, okay, sign the contract. Uh, bought the property. Now, when you look at it, main it was like off the the main street, like I kind of uh, one of the big busy street intersections opposite a cemetery. Got no sunlight. Terrible. Um, but at the time, I got my first time owners grants. Moved into it for six months. Did a bit of work and then rented it out as soon as you could. So that got me in the market. Yeah. And you got to remember at this stage, you know, graduates, so I'm not really earning a lot of money, uh, but I want to buy the next property. And so I bought the next one was a unit at Liverpool. Again, you know, buying units because at, at Sydney, that's what I thought I could afford. Yeah. Uh, so then bought a unit you know, again. Liverpool is like, okay, population is meant to increase. I'm like, okay, that's all I need to know. A cheap price point under 300 grand. Um, bought that top floor unit right near the station. Uh, Again, you, you would have recommended to your enemy right now, but anyway, got me in. Um, so we had two properties, probably under 30 at that stage, and then I started the business when I was, what, 31. So at that point, I'm like, right, this is the time to jump in. So I effectively stopped buying property and then started the business. And because of a couple of years, I would mortgage choice and they started again. So it effectively wiped me out for a few years. And then at that point, once being out, we were married and then we're looking where to live. And uh, we said, look, the business can start to take off and we'll buy a property off the plan. You know, suburb, it was in the beaches area to, uh, in a suburb called Little Bay. And it was just out near, near Maroubra. I'm like, okay, look, we can live out here. We can maybe have one or two kids in a unit. Um, and and so we committed to an off the plan purchase and like every off the plan purchase over time and over budget and 
changing builders and all the other jazz that came with it. And then by that stage, um, we our life had changed completely. We wanted to be out of Sydney. We wanted to move down to the South Coast. Uh, we wanted to start a family, and there was no way that we wanted to raise a, a baby in a small unit. And so at that point, you know, it never was intended to be an investment. So we turned that uh, that that unit once came uh, off the plan and settled. That became an investment property, which did which did pretty well. And, and all three properties when we had them all did relatively well. They all increased in value. There weren't really any major issues. I had the Liverpool tenant. From the start to the finish was the exact same tenant in wow. that property. Um, wow. So, I mean, I was fairly lucky that I had little turnover. Uh, the Parramatta property, we got in there, we renovated that, um, certainly overcapitalized on renovations. In fact, we out-renovated the market, which was a learning curve for us. Like we put beautiful subway tiles, beautiful floors. So that's what we wanted, uh, not what the market wanted. So it stuck out like a sore thumb in this sea of like beige apartments and there was this like spruced up unit um and we learned we learned the hard way okay okay when we go to renovate let's not overcapitalize so to go to that point and then we bought a little commercial car park through our, our super that was yielding some good numbers so it was at that point where let's just keep buying anything there was no strategy around it um and then we got to the point that we wanted to buy our home down here on uh, about an hour and a half south of Sydney, uh, north of Wollongong. Yep. And we said, right, we've got some cash, but the investment properties have probably done their job, so let's sell them off. Yep. And we made that decision. The market was was good timing, so we sold sold all the properties and, and got some more cash, bought our home. And that's where I really talk about the rent vesting model. Like when, when kids come along, it probably changes your outlook on rent vesting. Like we we wanted to settle down, we wanted to have put down roots. Uh, I think it's important as a family to you know, not bounce around because that's what I wanted for my family. Uh, where's where we're going to send them to school? So you got to start thinking about that as well. And yeah, that's that that formed the basis of the decision to sell. And then I guess moving forward, uh, we uh, last year we bought a commercial site for our our business. Uh, that was a pretty decent outlay. Um. And and I think that what got us to hear service right, but won't get us to the next level. So we had to think bigger to set up a unit trust. We co-bought that big site as well, and to we're now buying another investment property. So I felt we had a pause in our journey uh, while we're growing the business. Yep. The business has now grown as a cash flow asset, and now we can go back into property assets. And now we're and we're looking to buy a few more investment properties throughout this year. So for me, yeah, what about what I the message I kind of want that to come out is they weren't perfect assets, but what they did was get me into the market. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Yeah. I, what I love about what you've done and, and, and I love the openness that, that, that you shared that, you know, that uh, they weren't perfect properties, but they've done okay. That the key thing is you've taken some action and uh, you've learned a lot along the way. Cause I, I don't know about you, Aaron, but one of the things that I see in, in the property sphere is that uh, in terms of investing in the property is one thing, but investing in your knowledge and experience is just as important. And as, as as both of those happen in parallel, as your knowledge increases and your comfort level increases, uh, that you're it's starting to make better decisions down the track. And that only happens once you've actually got your hands dirty and your feet wet and made some mistakes in the, in the property game because you then learn from those and know what to do and what not to do. Uh, so eventually, as, as both... You know, your professional and your personal and your passive journeys are, are happening and that comfort and knowledge is increasing, you're then in a much better decision to make better decisions uh, as you go through. Is, it, is that uh, been true for you? Absolutely. Like, I mean, having equity in there to draw out, would I've never have been able to save that much money to buy the next property and then to buy the next one, for example. Uh, so when you look at it going, they may have been imperfect properties. Um, now that you've got buyer's agents, out of the time, the buyer's agent's proposition wasn't as strong as it is now. So you had to go to seminars. Who do you trust at these seminars, for example? I had to go to like meetups, like these property meetups. And you're like, who are these strangers? And can I even trust the advice? And reading a few of the magazines, for example, like you had to really educate yourself. Whereas now there is a plethora to the point that it's almost oversaturated. Yeah. And it's like, well, the same question still. See, 
who do you trust? What agenda does someone have? Yeah. Um, so I think that hasn't changed, but what has changed is our access to to data, access to like case studies, access to professionals around the country, whereas you would probably geographically change in the past as well. So um, yeah, I, I, all I take out of that is I take action and I see clients that take action versus don't. And you've got a real good test case, control case, and you go, the take action group will always win. Yeah. Because they're failing forward at least. Absolutely spot on. I 100% agree with you. Uh, it's something I just want to touch on there, and it is, it's a great question that I picked out of your book, which we're going to talk about in, in part two in more detail. Yeah. But, uh, and, and this is something that I, I don't think is appreciated enough until after the event, but uh, what feeling did you get when you bought your home down south? The It's indescribable is what I'll say. I will articulate the feeling. Um, there is no greater feeling that when you open that door that no landlord can increase your rent or give you a notice to move out. Let me just, that is worth so much. And when I, and when I opened the door, I was like, why didn't anyone tell me this earlier, that this was the feeling that you felt? Uh, yeah, we can put artwork up. Yeah, we can do all this. But I'm like, no rental increases, no having to reapply, no having to move again. This is ours. Like at that stage, the interest rate could have been double what it what actually was, and it wouldn't even have mattered at that point. Yeah. Like sitting outside, that champagne to celebrate, Bernie and I, and we're like, this is ours. No one can ever kick us out. I'm like, that's what I'm going to tell people. There's a feeling that comes, and, you know, I, I could feel it when friends or family came to visit, they just felt so at ease. No one's going to risk the bond on the property, spill wine. I don't really care. The kids have gone nuts and places there. I don't really care. It's ours. It's ours to do what we want with it as well. And so when you're doing the gardening, you know it's a return on your time investment. It's going to make us happy. We're not going to have to move out again. We're not improving someone else's home. Um, I think the dynamics with the relationship, the neighbors change as well. We actually want to get you to know your neighbors. I lived in Sydney. I didn't even know my neighbors in our unit block and no one really cared because we were all transient. So there's no like connections. Whereas now I'm like, we're away. Bins come in and out. The gardens tended to, they're watching the house, they're feeding the fish. There is so much of a connection that happens in a street level when it's like, hey, we're all living here. We want to make sure that everyone's you know, upholding the community standards in this street as well. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, why didn't someone tell me about this? People think it's about an interest rate or a loan application. I'm like, no, no. no. You, that's what you're buying. That's what you're buying. I, I love them. The, the, it's it's hard to describe, yeah. uh, but that that sense of connection uh, with the place, with the people, uh, yeah, you, you can't put a dollar value on it. There's no question about that. Now, I love that. Um, before I sort of jump into the future, uh, Aaron, and get your thoughts on where you're heading and, and what you're doing to continue to make that happen, the one question I just sort of want to uh, dive into uh, that sort of brings together the property experience, the mortgage broking experience you had. Uh, is there anything that you still struggle with? Oh, there's a lot I struggle with. Uh, I'd say in the very start, even your what you said around achievement and contentment, I think there was a connection that you made there. Um, I, I struggle with it because I don't, I look, I've got two kids and we live in a coastal lifestyle. So sometimes you can fall into this like lifestyle trap of going, this is pretty good um, and and not pushing the envelope. And that's where I'm like, no, no, I, I want to be the hybrid of like lifestyle and performance. Yeah. And they they can be quite jarring at times. Uh, they can feel like they're competing priorities uh, because performance means that you show up and you've got to be pretty intense and that, like, there's, come on, mate, timing's money. We've got to move, move, move. And, and it has to level of intensity with the team as well. Uh, and then you walk outside, it takes you five minutes to get a coffee, whereas Sydney, it takes me 30 seconds because they already know who I am. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I have wrestled with that, but I think it's the environment has actually forced me to then look at it going, it's not all go, go, go. Hey, there's, there's a really good community vibe here. It's okay to chill out. And it still can mean that you can still be high performance in some areas, but when I'm pushing the kids on a swing, 
and the guy next to me just wants to say g'day and it's like there's no ego here it's like we're all equal we're the same doesn't matter our paychecks doesn't matter our job status or the value of our home we're two equals pushing our kids at the park on a Saturday because we want to show up and be really good dads and present you know, fathers and husbands and people in our community and like that's that's where again I, I, I really tried to find solace in that yeah, if that well, answers your question yeah, no, no, I think that that tension, uh, and particularly with uh, uh, with the male gender who are, are often very achievement driven, uh, trying to achieve that balance, and, and, and you strike me uh, as a bit of a, a type A personality, to some degree, uh, which means that you know you, you're always striving, uh, and and that getting that sort of delicate balance between that and enjoying life is is always a bit of a challenge. It's certainly something that. Uh, I continue to contend with, and again, yeah. like Bernadette, I'm luckily got Sonia in the background, sort of uh, uh, grabbing me and saying, "Hey, hold on, wake up yourself, Bushy." Uh, so, yeah, that that partnership and the, and the family environment uh, really grounds me and brings me back to worth uh, more often than not. So, I really appreciate you sharing that, mate. But um, I, I want to sort of jump forward now and extending a little bit of what we just talked about, really, uh, and coming back to the whole concept of living by design. Can you sort of paint us a picture of what your ideal life vision and, and ideal lifestyle does look like? And it sounds like you're pretty close to living it. And in association with that, once you've sort of put some shape around it for us, what's your ongoing investment strategy to both attain and then maintain that and why? Yeah, lifestyle, if I'm to talk about like the ideal flow in life, um, yeah, being present. Like the other day I went to pick up my daughter after school, which means I've got to leave the office early. Um, the struggle is real, you know, working parents, I've got to be out the door by 2.30, but it means I just get hyper-focused in my day and what I'm saying yes to and what I'm saying no to. And I often, and I had this with my coach a while ago, I'm like, I feel like I'm running out of time. And he's like, no, no, you don't have a time problem, you have a priority problem. And that stopped me dead in my tracks that I don't say I don't have enough time anymore. I just say, look, I've got to, find pri- I've got to reprioritize. And so for me, non-negotiable is like, I like to get up, I like to train in the mornings. I go to the gym, do something, uh, be active, and I get enjoyment out of that, which means I have to get up early. They want to be around for the kids for breakfast, something to help Bernie in the mornings as well, get the girls ready. Great. That means I go to the gym in the morning. That means Bernie goes in the evenings, which means I'll do bar, you know, put him down for bed. And I think there's there's a compromise that has to happen in lifestyle because I'm we're at a stage where our kids are three and five, like they need... They physically need me around. They can't put themselves down. They can't put their clothes on all the time. They can't cook their own dinner. I have to, we, one of us has to be around. Yeah. And it's time, it's this season in our life where we're not doing the big extravagant holidays. We tried it. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't what we hoped for. So being I love to travel like yourself. That's something that we did pre-kids. What we did last year was you go on a holiday with your friends, I'll go on a holiday with my friends. And it worked because someone's still going to be around for the girls. But we know at some point in the future we're planting a seed for a beautiful Disneyland trip for the girls. And like when they're of age that they will enjoy to remember it, that's when we'll go. But until then, it's gonna be fairly low key, holidays up and down the coast, driving distance. They want to pull in a park, let's do that. And so again, the ego wants the beautiful trip. The sensible self says, that's ridiculous. They're not even going to remember it. Why don't we go and do something that actually will create a memory for us as a family? And that's that in the lifestyle um, element for me is, you know, we blocked out all our holidays for the year, throughout the year. And when I worked at out, Bushy, you're probably the same. I'm only at work 55% of the year. So you take annual leave, you take sick leave, you take public holidays, you take my personal development days for the year, coaching days out. I was in there and then weekends. And then you take the actual work week and I'm like, I'm only at work 55% of the year. And then I did it with our team. I was like, we're paid for a whole year, but we're only showing up to be work for 55%. What are we doing that other time that we've got? And so it got us really conscious about what are we doing off the field? Because we've got a game plan for work, the strategy for the team, what's everyone expected in terms of numbers and KPIs, what's our KPIs off the field. And that to me, again, we talk about lifestyle really put into perspective about how much time I'm investing in my family, my personal well-being, my social, my f- network, my friendships as well. And that's where Bernie and I go, well, we can be here, but we sort of maintain our social connections, our friend connections, and, and have the space to do that. 
Yeah, I love that. Uh, and, you know, sort of talking about it, you don't have a time issue, it's a priority issue, and then deciding and having uh, plans for your, your professional life but also your personal life and then balancing the two is something that a, that a lot of people don't even have the self-awareness uh, to be thinking about that, Aaron. Uh, and as you well said, the, the ego often gets in the way because it then becomes about what you should be doing rather than what you really want to be doing and, and what's really important. So I uh, love, the, love the balance that you sort of uh, define with all of that. Um, uh, before we sort of uh, sort of reflect back on some bits and pieces, I'd love your thoughts, given your involvement in the property, the money, and the, and the lending game. Uh, what uh, is, is one borrowing idea or approach you think that the majority of people get wrong in your experience? Yeah, I'd say not borrowing to their maximum. Yeah, and uh, it sound it can sound irresponsible, but I'll give you some perspective and put it into context. They're like, I don't want to borrow too much, um, you know. And I'm like, well, the bank already does a, a, a serviceability, like a, a buffer on that. They buffer up your your living expenses. They buffer up your credit card. So I'm like, the bank has done a stress testing for you. That's one part. But if you borrow just a little bit more and you're able to buy a better home, that's what I'm talking about. And they can't connect that dots until I explain it to them. So I had a client, didn't want to borrow up to their limit. I said, look, you can borrow here, but you actually have the borrowing capacity to go to here. Now that means you you actually buy in a better street, in a better location, and a property that's already renovated, which means you don't have to spend money on those renovation costs. And if that means you don't have to move again, that means not selling agent's fees and no stamp duty in the future again took a journey for me to explain that to them because obviously I'm so wet into this concept that I've got to take someone on that journey to get them to understand it. Yeah. But once they can connect the dots, again, the penny dropped for them and said, okay, I understand what you're saying here. We can find somewhere where you're comfortable. And I told this to young people. I'm like, your income's only going to go up. Young professionals, uh, they're, you know, white collar, educated. I'm like, this is the lowest your income's going to be. So don't be afraid to take on a little bit more because your income's only going to go up over time and you'll be able to service this loan and you almost kick yourself that you didn't go and buy that superior asset. Yeah? Absolutely. Uh, and the other one is like, well, people leave it too late and then they're now they've got one child or two kids and now they're trying to buy them. Like this worst scenario because one partner's down to part-time, they've got two dependents on a, on a bank's calculator. I was like, double income, no kids is the sweet spot because you've got the best income and you can grind through that phase. Imagine trying to rent and then trying to buy and you've been out of the market for so long and your savings just hasn't kept up. Get into the market, buy, you know, spend a little bit more than what you think you need and it means that you don't have another move in you. I mean, like, that's not a bad outcome. Bring it out, come And getting them to think beyond that year and now, uh, as you've just described, uh, to think uh, longer term and big picture about, you know, how's your life going to change and, and, you know, you sort of, uh, unpack some of that in your own journey uh, and the benefits of doing that, uh, having that bigger discussion so that they're looking at the decision now in that context uh, is brilliant, mate. Uh, it might, and we'll, we'll deep dive a lot more on that when we unpack the uh, Happy Line of Loan Handbook uh, in episode two. But to sort of bring this all together then now, if you're reflecting back on your uh, life and journey so far, if you were starting out again, would you in invest in anything differently? And I'm not just talking about investing in property, but knowledge, relationships, energy, you name it? Absolutely. Uh, let me tell you, when I first, I missed one of the greatest opportunities um, to change my life. So when I got my redundancy from Wizard, I met with a lady called Jacinta. Now, everyone will know her name now. At the time, no one knew her name. She got the franchise agreement for Anytime Fitness in Australia. And I was going to be the second one amongst the, the first handful of people to get an Anytime Fitness business in Australia. She had one on George Street and she met me personally in a coffee shop. And I went back and told all my friends about this concept of the 24-hour gym. We're talking like 2008. Yep. And they said, are you mad? No gym is going to be open 24 hours. And I was like, she's brought this concept from America. They've got always in America. It's like, yeah, it happens in America. It doesn't happen here. Anyway, let her, and, and my, my parents, my mum was like, we'll mortgage the house. And my brothers are like, that's a lot of money for our parents to give you as a 20-something-year-old. And I think at that point, 
they yeah, listening to other people was to my own detriment. So I missed the greatest opportunity. And naturally, if I had enough conviction in my own heart, I should have done it. So I can't blame others. I take personal responsibility. That I missed a shot that I didn't take. But I think at that point, it really cemented to me is like, no, I have this saying, no pay, no say. So if you're not paying my mortgage, you don't have a right to say where I buy or what I buy. That's my decision. And I tell it to clients all the time. Same for like weddings. Everyone's got an opinion on someone else's wedding. But I'm like, if you're not paying for it, then don't have an opinion on it. And kind of stay in your lane a little bit. Goes professionally. I'm not a tax advisor, so I can't give tax advice. Therefore, I don't weigh into that conversation. And uh, you, you and I probably see it where we've got people that overstep their their boundary lines and it makes our jobs probably infinitely harder to convince them because someone of trust, whether it's a family member, whether it's another advisor, has mentioned something that goes against the ground for what we truly believe in and it makes it difficult for us to, to, to float an idea. So I'm really big on that going, no, 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 ignore everyone else's noise. You do what you truly believe in and that conviction will get the success that you're after. Love it. Love it. Mind you, and I can see why you feel that way about that opportunity. But I, I think, and I, I don't know about you, but one of the things that, that is very attractive to me, and I, I had a uh, passive income um, moment uh, when I had my early life crisis back in my early 30s, Aaron, and, and yeah. almost overnight from there, everything I invested in had to have a residual income component, it had to grow in value and it had to be saleable. Uh, yeah. the, uh, what you're now doing and the legacy that you're building around that uh, and the income stream and, and the, the personal control you have over that versus uh, being part of a, a franchise operation, I, it, it may be a blessing in disguise. So let, let me just say that. So Absolutely. And and the, but the benefit of hindsight, isn't it? And at the time, it's like, what you don't know is what you don't know. Um, so yeah, you're spot on, which is if I took that part, we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. If I took that part, there are so many Australian families that I may not have had an impact on. Exactly. Exactly. Well, no, I love that. Not ever. I, I, there's so many properties that you know, I drive by, like, we inspected that property, didn't we? Like, yeah, we inspected that property. I was like, but if we took that, if we went through that door, we wouldn't have got to this point. I mean, we would have met our neighbours who are the best things since sliced bread. We wouldn't have gone to this school where our kids have best friends. Like, you just can't, I can't, we don't even live in the past anymore. It's like, that was cool. We looked at that place and like, yep. And didn't happen so there's no point even wondering anymore yeah i love that i'd say that's a great approach to life uh mate i'm now going to give you the old blindfolding cigarette and uh, uh hit <laughs> the, the ambush fast four uh and, and we're going to do this is round one so you've got another chance in episode two but to kick that off what would the title of the book about you be if your worst enemy wrote it and you probably don't have too many enemies but it's oh. one what would they be the title nah, I've got, oh look okay. I don't think I have enemies, but okay, let's have a look at this. I'd go the ultimate paradox, I'd, I'd say. Um, I like to, I like to, uh, what's the word? I'm frugal, but I love the finer things in life. And, uh, you know, I drive, a, I drive a very mediocre car, but I love cars. <laughs> so, yeah, like, here's an idea. There's like, a, yeah. I love it. I love it. That's yeah. That, that, again, that, uh, I'll put you on the spot with that one. Uh, that, that was, that was a, a very a good and very apt uh, description, I reckon, mate. Um, uh, switching gears a bit, if, if you could have a coffee with anyone, either alive or a dead historical figure or anyone, who would you choose or why? Maybe my grandfather or my great grandfather, in that sense. Um, and I'll only say this in context because I watched his video about. They did it with kids. So who do you want to have dinner with? And the parents said, oh, I want to have dinner with a barber. And the kids like, I said, I just want to have dinner with my parents. And I was like, that penny drop moment that you don't need to have someone famous to, to feel good about it. I think for my grandfathers, or great grandfathers, it's like, look where I've ended up. Like, look what happens in generations when good decisions are made. Yeah. And the bloodline is now the benefit or the beneficiary of having great decisions made. Yeah, beautiful. It's said, mate. Uh, again, a, a bit of a shift. What superpower do you wish that you had and why? Uh, this is easy. I'd go teleportation. I'm always running late and, uh, and I hate traffic. <laughs> so if I could teleport somewhere, I'd be on time and less stressed. 
I love it, mate. I, the, the, what that's telling me is you're you're always packing as much value into every interaction than and what often happens. Is. Just in time, running on yeah. a just in time. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and last question comes back to the the money exercise. If if I gifted you fifty million dollars today, what would you do with it? Why? Yeah, they'd be buying assets. So I'd buy family houses. Uh, I'd buy us a, a pretty decent property portfolio. There'd be a mix of shares. Um, I'd say three quarter of that would be invested. Property, shares, uh, back into our business, for example. There'd be no debts for anyone in, 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 the, in the inner circle. Uh, there'd be a good portion of that paid forward to some of the charities that we support. You know, we, we build homes in, in the Philippines. I'd be doing something like that. I'd go to Sri Lanka and do something there as well, I'd say, um, in some way, shape or form. Um, and I think at that point, I'd still, I get this sometimes as a joke a question, but I'd still work, I think, in some form. Yeah. Uh, I think at that point, the money would, you see how many times people get, windfalls of cash and uh and are fine for bankruptcy particularly in america um i just don't think we're equipped to handle that much money i'd have to go to work and still keep it pretty real with the people that had problems isn't it yeah and it's about purpose i think i, I don't know about you but uh without purpose i'm nothing so uh you know my intention in the uh, long term is to be to be having conversations with great people like yourself on the podcast for as long as my voice holds up Aaron. yeah uh, so, Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't work as hard. Uh, I'd still show up to work, but just probably not as hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, spot on. But uh, it's been a, a great uh, start to our conversation. I'm really looking forward to jumping into uh, the book in episode two. So I really want to uh, thank you for sharing the ins and outs of your journey so far. And uh, for those that want to keep the conversation going, I uh, really encourage everyone to jump and jump on and join the uh, Property Hub Collective Interactive Facebook community, which you can click on in the show notes uh, so that we can keep that conversation going. So I uh, really look forward now to uh, part two, and uh, I'll see you then, Aaron. Thanks, Bush. You really appreciate it. Stay tuned Thanks, for part two of this interview next episode. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights, direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge and I look forward to seeing you next time.